A presidential candidate in Ecuador has been assassinated. A presidential candidate was assassinated on the campaign trail. Political assassination in Ecuador has thrown that country into a state of emergency. The candidate was known for speaking up against corruption. It happened in broad daylight. The presidential candidate, Fernando Villavincio, 10 days before the election, was assassinated by cartel narcos as he left a campaign rally. It's the most shocking development yet in what Biaviencio called Ecuador's descent into a narco state. Across the country, crime has been soaring with the murder rate more than doubling in just the past two years. Violent cartels have gone to war, vying for control over lucrative drug trafficking routes and using murder, terror and corruption to control politics. Overcrowding and corruption in the prison system has led to full-scale armed battles between gangs, causing the current presence of Ecuador to declare a 60-day state of emergency, sending out troops to guard polling stations in the run-up to the election. Now, the question everyone's asking is how did this actually happen? Ecuador used to be one of the safest countries in South America. In 2015, the murder rate in Ecuador had fallen to a historic low of just over 6 per 100,000 people, a little bit lower than the USA. Sandwiched between Peru and Colombia, both known for conflict and instability, and Ecuador used to be called the Island of Peace. After coming to power in 2007, former President Rafael Correa tackled organized crime at the roots. He raised people out of poverty, cutting off the cartel's source of foot soldiers and manpower. He put more funds into the police, giving them more resources to fight criminal groups, and he even gave amnesty to gangs and gang members, looking for a way out. But he failed to create a sustainable system. In a key decision, he cut ties with the American DEA and closed the American military base at Manta, a poor city halfway down Ecuador's western coast. But much worse was his privatization and selling off of Ecuador's ports and airports. All of these decisions, left Ecuador's coastal waters free of surveillance and policing, while security at the international borders fell apart. Traffickers looking for an easy way to get drugs out of South America were quick to capitalize on the opportunity. When Correa left office in 2017, everything was already beginning to unravel. It didn't begin in Ecuador though. The biggest change came in Colombia. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, have been fighting a brutal insurgency against the Colombian government for 51 years. After decades of fighting, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, otherwise known as FARC, finally came to a negotiating table with the government. In a massive breakthrough for the country, they signed a peace deal involving disarmament, relocation, and eventually FARC becoming a normal, non-violent political party. And this was great for Colombia, but it spelled disaster for Ecuador. FARC was heavily active in the south of the country on the border with Ecuador. They held a near-complete monopoly on smuggling routes into the country, keeping conflict at a low. When they suddenly dissolved, it left a vacuum which all the rest of the narco groups in the area moved in to exploit. At the same time, cocaine production was only going up, increasing the violent competition for Ecuador's valuable route to the sea. So Ecuador's next president, Lenin Moreno, floundered in the face of the massive influx of drugs and violence. He had served as Correa's vice president, but he broke off from his faction and tried to solidify his own power within the government when he took office. In a series of political purges, he ousted Correa loyalists and tried to replace them with his own cronies. A lot of Moreno's opponents were judges in Ecuador's political system. Some of them he fired, others turned against him. The result though was that the presidency lost control over the rest of the state as he alienated different parts of the government one after another. He did let the US military establish a base on the Galapagos Islands, but it was far too little way too late. But the most important and understated problem that Moreno caused was corruption. But before we continue, I want to talk about a video sponsor. Have you ever Googled yourself and were shocked to see your personal information exposed in one of those public listing sites? Data brokers are making a fortune selling your information to robocallers, spammers, and others who want to learn more about you, like where you live. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, Aura. Aura can identify data brokers exposing your info and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. Now, brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to, but if they make it super hard to do, let Aura handle it for you. And you can try Aura for free for two weeks using my link. Aura also does so much to protect you and your family from online threats you can't see. It's super easy to set up and you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. Instead, you get everything in one at an affordable price. So let Aura do the hard work of keeping you safe online so that you can focus on other tasks with peace of mind. You can either let people continue to exploit and profit off your private information, or you can go to aura.com for forward slash moon to start your two week free trial, also linked down in the description below. Over the course of his presidency, corrupt cronies and opportunistic crooks took advantage of the chaos at the top of government, and with the cartels moving in, there were plenty of bribes to go around. Moreno himself was now under investigation on bribery charges relating to the shady construction of a hydroelectric plant. 
But what were all these cartels so interested in? Well, by taking over Ecuador, they could create an easy and quick route to the sea. Starting in the Colombian rainforest, cocaine producers sell their product to various gangs and traffickers, like the now infamous prison gang Los Lobos. They would traffic it through Ecuador and take advantage of the lack of security at the airports and the ports. In Guayaquil, for example, one of Ecuador's largest port cities, only 20% of the cargo ever gets searched. Once it gets past the border, the cocaine then makes its way to the USA, often through Mexican cartels who have already begun a proxy war in the country. Both the Sinaloa cartel and the New Generation Jalisco cartel have been instrumental in increasing the violence, or it might get sent over to Europe through connections with the Albanian criminal organizations. But the chaos begins in prisons. Already overcrowded before, the prisons saw ever more inmates due to the increased arrests of drug traffickers and gang members. These weren't a result of more efficient policing though, just a product of the increased violence and chaos on the streets. Unsurprisingly, packing thousands of murderous gang members into crowded cells with few guards during an ongoing gang war doesn't really end well, and corruption played its part as well, with gang leaders often gaining complete control of the prisons, down to actually owning the keys to the cells. It also let them bring explosives and heavy weaponry into the prisons. So riots became commonplace, with hundreds of inmates actually dying in all-out wars between rival gangs. In 2021, over 500 inmates were killed, whilst hundreds more escaped custody as control over the prisons fell apart under the pressure. In just one single riot, 119 inmates were killed in a battle involving fists, machetes, grenades, and firearms. Two months later, at the same prison, it happened again. That time, 68 people died, and it hasn't been much better outside the prison system. Rivalries between the gangs and who controls the smuggling routes overflowed into the streets. Assassinations, bombings, and other terror tactics happen every single day. And as the COVID pandemic and the economic crisis that came with it hit Ecuador, millions were left unemployed and in full-on poverty. Combined with their typical tactics of threats and extortion, the cartels found easy recruits for their ongoing wars. So the murder rate spiked from 6 by 100,000 people to 16, and the government was unable to control the chaos. So elected to replace Moreno in 2021, the new president Lasso would have a huge job in his hands, but he too failed to slow the violence. So protests racked the country over the economic situation and the lack of safety in the country. Almost immediately, his approval ratings dropped like a stone, and he was impeached by Ecuador's National Assembly. Just two years into his term of office, Lasso had tried to push through reforms to the justice system that would have let them tackle the problem more directly. But because he included other reforms designed to give him control over a government that was already at his throat, the bill failed to pass. But they probably wouldn't have worked anyways, as Lasso has been under investigation for ties to the Albanian Mafia, after a leaked document implicated him and his top officials. Then when a recording was released of two police generals discussing how to stop the investigations and protect Lasso, this would be the final straw. Which brings us to today, where corruption in Ecuador has spread everywhere. I mean, a ton of cocaine was mysteriously found on an Ecuadorian airbase operated by their air force. Radar equipment used to detect trafficker boats was also destroyed in an inside job. The Navy has also been embroiled in scandals surrounding their collusion with drug traffickers, as has the army and some top generals. The government has been completely absent, and it's the reason why security and crime is now the most important issue for voters. But in this dark sea of corruption, Fernando was a shining beacon of honesty. He began his career as an investigative journalist, exposing corruption and evil wherever he could find it. He was instrumental in uncovering detailed information about Assange's time at the Ecuadorian embassy. Pursued by Korea's previous administration for airing their dirty secrets, he was forced into exile after dodgy charges were leveled against him. When he returned in 2018, after Korea lost his power, he campaigned under the banner of law and order, promising to expunge the criminal influence from the country. He made waves, securing a seat at the National Assembly and continuing his fight for justice. And so the cartels would be quick to respond with death threats. In September of 2022, he narrowly avoided death after a would-be assassin opened fire on his home. They're not going to break me where his worst the press. And his campaign for presidency in 2023 picked up steam as more people got tired of feeling unsafe. And so just a few weeks ago, Fernando was polling in second place. The cartels and prison gangs were extremely frightened by this, as this was a man they could not intimidate nor corrupt. And it's what led to the tragic events of the 9th of August, where he would be assassinated. Almost immediately after, a video then emerged of a masked gunman taking credit for the crime and claiming it for the prison gang Los Lobos. But other Los Lobos gang members have said they're being framed, so it's still really unclear who the perpetrators were really looking for are. So what can a government do to combat something like this? Well, the truth is that violent gang activity at scale is an extremely difficult 
difficult problem to solve, many governments have tried and failed, but we can just look north of Ecuador for an example of one that succeeded, at a cost. El Salvador officially began the war against gangs in March of last year as a direct response to a crime spike that resulted in 87 murders across the country, 62 of them occurring in a single day. Tonight, El Salvador is under state of emergency after a deadly weekend of gang violence. The National Civil Police reporting 14 people murdered on Friday and 62 the following day, making Saturday one of the deadliest days in 30 years. Es algo que nosotros como salvadoreños no podemos permitir. Y por eso es que estamos acá. On Sunday, Congress approving emergency powers to loosen arrest rules and empower the national police for the next 30 days. And now, just 60 months later, the federal government has imprisoned over 70,000 people on gang-related charges. The streets are safer than they've ever been in the country, and civilian approval of the Salvadoran president is through the roof, peaking at nearly 91% just a month ago. However, if you look just under the surface, there is another problem with El Salvador here, because the Salvadoran government's criteria for arresting citizen on suspected gang activity became extremely ambiguous. There is a dark underside that's hidden from view. Human rights groups are dismayed, as are relatives, as more than 65,000 people have been arrested over the past year. Is it paint a picture of a penal justice system that is no longer a penal justice system? It's more of a type of a concentration camp in which soldiers and police and prison guards and attorney generals decide who goes free, who stays uh, in prison, who lives, who dies, uh, and torture uh, at their pleasure. Requiring little to no evidence. You see, the way they got rid of gangs is just targeting almost anyone they suspected of being a criminal. No proof needed. Simply traveling in a group, being in the wrong neighborhood, or even just having a tattoo could then get you locked up indefinitely. However, citizens are willing to live with the risk and a loss of general freedom if it means never fearing that either they or their loved ones will be murdered at the hands of gangs. Now, the state of exception approved by Congress has finally allowed us to enjoy peace. Now, at last, Salvadorans can think of more than not being killed. Which makes a lot of sense for Central and South America here, as the cartels are almost the de facto governments of these countries. So is this the answer for Ecuador? Well, there's little doubt that a similar crackdown on gangs would be extremely popular amongst Ecuadorians. Just look at the momentum of Villavicencio's campaign. Before the presidency, he was becoming extremely popular and had a good chance of becoming the president of Ecuador just before his death. Villavicencio was always outspoken about alleged links between politicians and organized crime. And seen here speaking at his last campaign event on the night he was murdered, it was no exception. Running on an anti-corruption platform, he was likely to get through to the second round of voting. So who will step up and promise to bring law and order to Ecuador, now that Bia Bicencio is gone? Well, so far, the two frontrunners to take over from Lasso is Correa loyalist Luisa Guterres and indigenous leader Jacob Perez. But they haven't really focused the messaging of their campaigns on crime. But because the unfortunate absence of Bia Bicencio, a relatively new candidate, millionaire businessman Jan Topic may now rise in popularity. Topic has centered his messaging solely around an authoritarian approach to domestic security and has welcomed direct comparisons to the El Salvadorian president. Topic, in addition to rising support from the masses in Ecuador, has also secured the support of three major Ecuadorian political parties, the Social Christian Party, a right-wing conservative group, the Democratic Center Movement, who previously supported Correa during his presidency, and the Patriotic Society Party, which was founded by former president and military officer Lucio Guterres, who successfully staged a coup. Topic has dubbed his alliance Ecuador sin miedo, which translated to English means Ecuador without fear. But given the poll numbers with just one week to go before a snap election, and it seems likely that the current frontrunner, Luisa Guterres, will win the presidency. But how will a potential Guterres presidency in Ecuador affect the rest of the world? Well, the most direct ripple effect a new presidency in Ecuador will likely have on the US and Europe is through its future handling of the Colombian drug trade. And to understand what that might look like under Guterres, we can take a closer look at what it looked like under Correa. Correa's government, despite bringing a steep dive in violence and record drugs seizures to Ecuador domestically was actually plagued with drug trafficking scandals. Evidence suggests that the key decision I already mentioned earlier, the decision by Korea to end the lease of the US naval base in Manta, and in turn creating a blind spot for Colombian drug smugglers to sell and fly through, was later revealed to be an exchange for campaign funding. From FARC. This is Jorge Briseño, a FARC commander. He's said to be reading a letter written by the group's late founder, Manuel Marulanda. Ayuda en dólares a la Assistance in dollars to Korea's campaign and subsequent conversations with his emissaries, including some agreements. 
and a string of similarly antagonistic foreign policy decisions, possibly driven by Korea's own political and career interests, saw Ecuador fall out with the US over time, because by doing this, this weakened US influence in the region and allowed countries like China and Russia to have more influence over South America, which is far too close to home for the US. And in addition, anti-narcotic measures between Ecuador, Colombia and the US almost completely screeched to a halt. This coupled with Korea's eventual relaxation of domestic crackdown on drug-related crimes at a very crucial time allowed for a direct path of cocaine supply from Colombia to the US and Europe, and caused Ecuador to become the key dispatch point for Colombian cocaine to reach the rest of the world. And Asim Gutierrez is prepared to adopt a similar foreign policy to her political idol in Korea, and further strain the relations between Ecuador and the US. She recently just opposed the US position on democracy in Venezuela, allying herself with the anti-American pink tide era politicians in Mexico and Argentina, and even vocalized her plans to give Korea himself a position as a key political advisor in her cabinet. And this is happening with major politicians in Central and South America like Almo and Mexico becoming more and more left-wing. And as they become more left-wing, they become more tied to countries like China and Russia. The US remains Latin America's top investor. Concerns have been raised in Washington about Beijing's influence. And this is why we're starting to see the cracks in the US's geopolitical power in Central and South America, a huge threat to the entire security of America. And while it's impossible to fully predict if a Guterres presidency in Ecuador will be as corrupt as Correa's, it's difficult to imagine a world in which her government makes it any better. And so despite a foreseeable future in which the streets get safer and the people of Ecuador trust their government again, Ecuador may now be on a very slippery slope into becoming a full-on narco state, completely outside the control of the US, allowing foreign powers to enter the region, exploiting the narco state to control more of South America. And with that, the ripple effects of what happened in Quieto on August 9th, 2023 will be felt all around the world. <laughs>